What's that? Yeah. Chuck, how long is the next commercial break? Let's take a consensus of how many people think Salazar's out of it? Chuck? Oh, well, all the experts. Can I um, split for a minute and 30? Thank you. At the next break, I will. Okay, yes. He has been? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I recall. <laughs> He's knocked off the Nautilus. Let me get some. But you didn't leave it. You didn't leave any. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that, you know that? <laughs> is that where he ran his two eleven? Is that where he ran his two eleven? Forty-five back. Yes, two eleven twenty-five. Okay. Now that's his best time. Hold on a second. Okay, thanks. Jama Roble. That's no, which uh, so brother is that? That's two oh five. Yeah, in a while. No, uh, Charlie Spedding. Are we talking about him winning? He, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, right. I'm looking yeah. for some bios right, we've, now. We've got him on. We've got Spedding covered. Seven, six, five. Four, three. The leaders again. With the marathon about 30, 39 minutes away from conclusion. Number 396 from Britain, 32 year old Charlie Spedding. We talked about him as the man who has already won two marathons this year. Mile 18, meaning we have a little bit more than eight miles to go. Just about the two thirds point. Now, mile 17 was run in 4.53. And mile 18 in 5.13, so the pace uh, really slowed down over the last mile. Well, that was the slowest mile of the race. Bill, Bill Rogers, can you hear us? Are we on an uphill grade right now? There is an uphill grade here. There is some shade. Everyone is showing the strain of the race. Everyone's covered with sweat, covered with water. Um, there's a pack of about 10 people. You can see Dixon and one of the Stowe brothers starting to fall back. The race is breaking up. This is getting into the real nitty-gritty of the marathon. The race begins at 20 miles, they say, and I'd say that that is true. So we're about two miles from, from that point right now. Do you still like Seiko's chances? I think Seiko looks better than anybody here so far. Uh, Charlie Spedding from England looks pretty strong. Lopesh keeps looking around. Seiko looks under control. He doesn't look like he's perspiring or having any trouble. De Costello, he looks pretty comfortable also. It's, it's still early. These guys have not cracked yet. It seems, Bill, that the Japanese are having a great race. They've got all three of their men up there in that pack, don't they? Yeah, they're all up Seiko there. They're all three of the finest marathoners in the world, though. One of the Soul brothers, I'm not sure if it's Takeshi or Shigeru, is falling back. He's really grimacing a lot. And uh, though he often runs that way, I think he's having a little trouble. There is Salazar. Now, he is dropping further back. He is 45 seconds behind. Bill, what about the effect of the fact that he had to run, unlike so many of the others, a marathon 11 weeks ago? Do you think that's taking its toll right now, or is it something else? I think there's only one answer I can get to that, and that is that it does not help the athlete. And I think we should do everything you can to help the athlete be in his best position at the Olympic competition. So the answer is what? The whole the marathon... Uh, four or five months beforehand, the trials that is? That's right. I think there are only a few countries in the world that have very severe competition to make their Olympic team, and ours is one. And we had ours so close to the Olympics, mm -hmm. I can't see it helping our team. Well, in, the, in the case of the women with Joan Benoit, there is not as much depth of competition on the women's side, so it was relatively easy for Joni to make the team. Right, That's the, that was the flip side of it. I was going to say that Joan ran some 12 weeks after the women's marathon trial. And you have Salazar today along with Tuttle and Fitzinger having run 11 weeks ago in the marathon in Buffalo, New York. There's the lead pack on a bright and sunshiny day in Los Angeles as the pack heads toward the Coliseum. And the crowd is unbelievable as we've watched it from the very start of the race. 
We've been looking at basically the same men now for several miles in that lead pack. John Tracy of Ireland is also up amongst them right now, number 471. He has joined that group. The Conga has been up there since the very beginning, and so has Spedding and Enzal. The Costella hanging right there. Tracy of Ireland and Lopez. Seiko, who may be the best positioned of all, and the Keishi So of Japan. Well, as Bill mentioned, it's getting to the breaking point now. There's a great shot of Carlos Lopez, who ran fantastic in the marathon in Rotterdam, right with De Costello to the last 200 yards. Everyone had expected him to go speeding by De Costello, but De Costello held him off. Boy, he wanted that water. Mm. That's a problem, but he'll have another shot at water. But uh, the thing that's, uh, you know, you have to remember, he ran a great marathon, a 209 marathon, looked good doing it. He's run three marathons. The other two, he dropped out at 20 miles, and they are not to 20 miles yet. So this is not, the race for the medals is far from over. Quite in contrast, this race to the one we saw last week with Charlie Spedding up there. He's number 396, low pack is number 723. Just to identify some of the numbers of the men you're watching in that lead pack, Enzo is 594. De Costello, number 25, of course. Seiko is 563. Tracy of Ireland is 471. Ikanga, 824. And of course, Salazar back off the pace now, number 936. So we can pick out the man you want to watch because we approach the 19 mile mark. In well, the Olympic marathon. I mentioned what a great race the uh, Japanese were having. The Irish have John Tracy up in that first group and Jerry Kearney, who is uh, also from Ireland, 32 years old, has run 2.13.20. A uh, good shot of uh, Salazar now, who, who with every moment now uh, is, is getting into more trouble. It's really too late for him to be this far behind. At this point, if he were to have a chance, he would have to be getting those seconds back every mile, and he doesn't appear to be doing it right now. The last mile, 5.11, the average right now, 4.59, and the composite time is about an hour and 35 minutes, about 35 minutes to go. They've completed 19 with a little bit more than seven miles remaining in the marathon. Well, they've slowed drastically in the last two miles. If we saw another two miles like this, then we would know that some of the runners are in great pain because if it slows down this much to, from 4.53 to a 5.13 and a 5.11, there must be a lot of pain. And also, no one is making the move and saying, well, it's slowing down, I'm going. So we know that they're all hurting equally as much, and that's good for people who have dropped off the pace like Dixon and Salazar. So Rogers, has it gotten a little cooler since they exited the freeway? Yeah, they've hit an area of shade for about the last mile, I would say. Everyone's looking pretty tired, I'd say, at this stage. Seiko has dropped his hat. De Costello is now behind Seiko. Uh, Dixon is about 35 meters back. There's still, as you can see, 10 or 12 people here. They're all trying to run in the shade. Yuma Ikanga looks very tired, but he's still right in the lead where he's been from the start. The lead pack in the marathon with about seven miles to go. Final event of the 1984 Olympics. time on this we've got your time huh Tracy yeah, Tracy Tracy Tracy. Tracy. Jerry Kiernan I think he went to Providence didn't he yeah huh? I don't I, him I don't Salazar's 44 seconds back okay what else can we talk about I just about? thought that Tracy thing was interesting that he had you know yeah because he could just suddenly go out like a light and, and I'll know and I'll know it happened shape. to him before yeah oh in the race in Moscow he was in great shape two laps to go and all of a sudden, with three quarters of a lap to go, uh, he started reeling. And okay. really what other esoteric things can we talk about? 205 is a guy from Djibouti, right, right. isn't he? Yeah, Djibouti yeah. was really relaxed. He was G. I think it was G. Like, anyway, he, yeah, he went far. Yeah. That guy, 205, just to say, going into the shot, was really relaxed. I know, that's a guy from Djibouti. Yeah. Hey, 204. Yeah. Well, we only know about them is they've been just, you know, under 212, but fired by the top. 204, you mean, not 205. 204 and 205 are both in it. 
Oh. They're having a great team race, too. Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't stress on your laurels. You get Djibouti was French Somalia. Five, okay. Four, one, three, two, one. We're back right now running in the shade. And at the Coliseum, that is what they are looking at at this very moment as we pull back that big television board. Uh, the peristyle into the Coliseum, that is how the people who are filing in to the Coliseum are observing what is taking place out on the streets right now. And so uh, they'll be well aware, as you can see, they're getting all prepared for what figures to be just a fabulous closing ceremony, which naturally we'll be covering for you. And this is part of it, the end of the marathon. And what a way to conclude it. Again, the, the lead pack. And it's starting to look like a college duel meet. We have two runners up there, 204, you see, from Djibouti, formerly French Somaliland. They have two runners. Providence College has two runners up there. Uh, both of them Irishmen, however. John Tracy, 471, and Jerry Kiernan uh, on the left in the uh, green shirt. So it uh, seems that the, there's a few countries that have some tremendous strength. And the two men from Djibouti, seem to be the surprise of these games. Right now in Culver City, mile 20, so a little bit more than six to go. And again, let's uh, retrace the path. It began at five o'clock, Santa Monica, down San Vicente, then along the ocean. They've made that turn, traversed the freeway. And there it is, the 20 mile mark. Right there, and that's uh, Jefferson Boulevard. <laughs> and again, that's the spot where they will look off to their right and see a site indigenous to Los Angeles. 20 miles in one hour, 39 minutes, 52 seconds at 5.05 for the last mile. And that average pace is very quick, very quick. We know it's hot out there, we know it's tough, and there's Salazar. Salazar, 45 seconds back as of about a mile ago. Right now they are on a pace in which the winner will finish in two hours and 11 minutes. And Alberto's time, the world best, is uh, much quicker than that. Although I know he was not going out to try and run 208 pace, but uh, he did not want to run this far off the path at this point in time. You see him glancing at his watch, so you have to hope that he knows where he is and how fast he's going uh, and is doing everything that he can. He's starting to move on some of these these runners who are starting to feel the effects of going out too fast, although that lead group does not seem to be having any tremendous crash and burn victims. They have slowed down, but no one has really shot out the back door drastically with uh, heat problems or anything of that of that choice. He's now a minute and three seconds behind, so things not looking very good at all for Alberto Salazar of the United States. Marty, who do you feel is most advantageously positioned right now? Well, I'd have to agree with Bill that uh, if the, the pack does not get away, then Seiko is going to turn this into a track race as they hit the track in the stadium. I would expect, we're at 20 miles now, that within the next three miles, that De Costello will make a move to pull away if no one else does it. And Seiko will try to go with him, and also Carlos Lopez will have very good chances of winning. But Ikanga, I think, has surprised everyone by running a very smart race, not going out and setting an outrageous pace in the beginning of the race. And when he's run 208 by using uh, a pace that was not very uh, smart, let's say, when he runs an even pace like this, he should be tough at the end. Now you've got Seiko and Di Costello in the 21st mile. There they are. It, in the opinion of many, it was going to wind up as a head-to-head -head duel between those two. It just might. And uh, there they are right now, very much uh, in contact with that lead pack, the forming part of that lead pack for quite some time, just off the pace being set at the moment. And the crowds continue to line the streets of Los Angeles. Well, I have to wonder if De Costello dropped back some 20, 25 yards because he's hurting, or as it appears that he's just as smart and dropped back so he have a good, clear run 
at the water station knowing that he needs that water, but you've got to wonder if the Africans now are making the, making the move and passing up the water stop on purpose to just gain that extra 10 or 15 yards. It's much like auto racing where the pit stops come into such great play. We saw in the women's marathon, Joan Benoit passed up the first water stop, gained a 10-yard advantage, and was never caught again. And right there is Charlie Spedding from Great Britain. Uma Ikanga of Tanzania. Spedding is 32. Ikanga, 27. Marty uh, mentioning Ikanga. Normally setting the pace, and today a little more slowly, so perhaps he will be right there at the end with the figures to be a great finishing charge by Seiko and Di Costello and the rest. John Tracy, number 471, in your picture as well right now. I think we should go to Bill right now. Bill Rogers, Marty. if you can hear me, what's happened to Di Costello? Marty, that's just what I was going to say. Just about one minute ago at a water stop, Rob Di Costello is falling off the pace. This pack really is splitting up once again. Uh, he's about 30, 35 meters behind. There's still six to seven runners in the lead. Uh, I'm not sure. There's been a lot of... There's, I think it's got to be the effect of the heat. There's a tremendous... It's just like a wide-open parking lot, and the sun is really glaring down. And he seems to have fallen off a significant amount. He looked like he was really kind of struggling, kind of like he was feeling the heat a bit. And Seiko still looks impassive and uh, like the heat is not bothering him at all. The same thing is true of Carlos Lopez. He's, make, he's turning around a lot and looking over to the side of the other runners. He looks like he's feeling the stress of the race, yet he's hanging in there. You think he may just be going through a bad patch and will be able to recoup, or are we getting too late into the race? I think it's, I think it's dangerous for Rob DiCostello to fall off this much. To be honest, I mean, he's probably the, he and Seiko are the two strongest runners in this race, the two men with the most strength. I think Rob may be having a, perhaps a bad day a little bit. Uh, certainly Seiko is running his usual race, right under control and never taking the lead. Bill, I know that Charlie Spedding, 396, trains in Boston with you. Did he win this thing? Yet yeah, Charlie has been in Boston. He's been training in the area for a month or two. You know, it's an interesting thing. The British, the Japanese, and the Australians have never had one of their countrymen win an Olympic gold medal. So if one of these men can take it for their country, I think it'll be a fantastic, prestigious, it'll be a, a spectacular achievement. That's the man we're looking at right now, Spedding of Great Britain. About five miles to go now in the men's marathon. Was that all? Two seconds. Oh. When I stretched. What did you say about that? Yeah. You can't hear any of this no. that he says? Did, was De Castella moving up or was yeah. that? Uh, no, no, yeah, there was, no, the, I mean, there was, there was a, a point there when we uh, were behind him when it looked like he was starting to pick it up again. Yeah. There he is. You can see his yeah. shadow. He's very recognizable. They took the pace up eight seconds. And he lost about eight seconds. So, yeah. He's got him on a charge now. Seiko will kill him. Yeah, he's getting back. How about Lopes, though? Can of Lopes. Tracy's not Lopes. Tracy. <laughs> He's looked bad for five miles, though. I didn't want to commit myself on it. That's right. He's gone, right? Is he there? Yeah. A minute and a half back. Yeah. Okay. Let's get some great stuff to say. What can I say? That's Enzo. There he is. Okay. Seiko is Seiko is there. Yeah. There he is. So we got one. What do we have? A pack of uh, seven. Yeah. One twenty-six. Okay. Okay. Right. That's correct. Yeah. We're we're checking it out right now too. Takashiki So, who his brother is really the better one, right? Talk about him. Huh? Yeah. Well, what do you got, for, uh, Barry? What do you got for Shell? A minute one. 126, uh, have they, have they 
who sells that? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, maybe they're surging. Let's try and get a good okay, split so coming up. 21 was 457. Right they didn't here, reach right? 22 yet, did they? That's our pack of six. We got Ikunga, Lopesh, Spedding, Tracy, So, and Inza. Okay. Wow, that's safe okay. way back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, okay. Bit of a dramatic development. While we were in that commercial, that is Seiko who has dropped back from the pack. And Di Costello is not in that pack either. As those other six begin to move away, you have in that pack of six, Joseph Enzal, Takeshi So, John Tracy, Charlie Spedding, Carlos Lopez, and Yuma Ikanga. And there is Seiko. We saw Di Costello drop back, and he has dropped further back. There is Seiko dropping back. Salazar is a minute and a half behind. We may have... Uh, a very big upset here in the marathon. Boy, but he does not look too upset himself. They can tell he's behind him. I think part of the reason they dropped back, they ran a 457 the last mile, and they may be gambling that these surges are starting and that, that they're going to check that Di Costello and Seiko still want to run an even pace in, but it's very late in the race to try to do that. For instance, if Charlie Spedding can open up 100 yards or so, even if Seiko works his way back up to be able to sprint with him at the uh, last half mile or so, Seiko would have used so much energy making up that gap in such a short period of time then Spedding could again go once more and perhaps win it. So Carlos Lopez right now will be heavily favored. The amazing thing, and I've been hesitating to mention it, is John Tracy from Ireland, 471. He's running his first marathon ever. And he is, as you can see, not the most beautiful runner in the world, but he is one of the toughest men in the world. Very tough trainer, has had a lot of adversity. However, I'm worried about him in his heat because in the Olympics in 1980, in the 10,000 meters, he was running along fine, and on the last lap, he just collapsed. But he came back a few days later in the 5,000 and finished seventh. So there is a tremendous surprise. Marty, they have... Uh Splintered even further now, as you can see, you've got a four-man pack, and you also have that last mile run in 447. Charlie Spedding, then you've got Joseph Enzal of Kenya, John Tracy of Ireland, Carlos Lopez of Portugal, and the men who have dropped back within the last 30 to 40 seconds are Ikanda of Tanzania and So of Japan. They've completed 22 miles, as we say that last mile in 447 the average pace is 458 about four miles to go now well they've really run a fast mile and there's there's the battle those two men have been thinking about each other for almost four yards four years and they are quite back but i think i would make a prediction that right now that the, of the four men in the first pack only one of them will get a medal and that man will be i can't tell you that all right, it's Enzo, Lopez, Tracy, and Spedding, the group of four. Four miles to go, heading down Exposition Boulevard. It's about eight minutes before seven o'clock. So we're maybe 18, 19 minutes away from entering the Los Angeles Coliseum. Number 723, 37-year-old Carlos Lopez of Portugal. And what an amazing story he is. He won the World Cross Country Championship, held at the Meadowlands in New Jersey this year at the age of 37 years. And he was injured after the last Olympics, had some operations on his Achilles tendon, but the Portuguese in this Olympics have been running very well. Mamadé of uh, Portugal broke the world record in the 10,000 meter earlier in the month, but didn't run well in the final of the 10,000 meters here. So they obviously know what they're doing. They've got some great coaching, and their country has gotten behind their distance runners for the last four years. Tracy and Charlie Spedding, no strangers to each other. It was thought that the Western Europeans would not be big factors in this race. Most of the marathoning talent coming from Africa, the United States, Japan, and of course, Di Costello of Australia. So the English and the Irish may have a great race shaping up after a disaster in 1980 for the British when none of their men even finished the race. That's a Tracy on the right, that's Lopez 
on the left of your screen. Bill Rogers, can you hear me? Yes. Bill, uh, at least looking at the monitor, Lopez looks like he's in a terrific shape at this point in the race. What do you think? If I would say the goal is going to go to Lopez. He's, he has kind of a maniacal look on his face. He looks like he's feeling a lot of strain, yet his form hasn't broken, but his face is so strained. He's been running kind of quietly, deceptively off to the side. Obviously, this is a gigantic major upset. The gold medal is not going to one of the major favorites. I don't think Seiko or Di Costello or Alberto has any chance to make a comeback um, at this time. The three medals is breaking down further. You can see that Joan is falling off the pace. And it's going to be tough to come on strong at the end under these warm weather conditions. Uh, Bill, do you think from your vantage point that Seiko and De Costello are totally out of it for the medals? I think they're out of it. They appear to be out of it. Look at that shot. We can uh, see the rest of the field lagging. Nobody seems to be... There's only five kilometers move. left. Right. We, we can That's see. three miles. And you've got to remember that Carlos Lopez has one of the fastest 10,000 meter times in the world. He's a world cross country champion, a very experienced runner, a lot of strength. Yet, this is a surprise, only his third marathon. I don't know, what can I say? <laughs> Actually, he's been in three marathons to this point. He's only finished one of them. That was uh, the Rotterdam Marathon when Di Costello won Tremendous it. Tremendous competitor. 39. So there is Lopez, number 723, three miles to go. Very shortly, they'll be making a right turn move down Menlo Avenue and go into the Coliseum and at the announced position in the Coliseum there to cover the closing ceremonies is Jim McKay. Jim? Now the mood here right now of course is one of tremendous anticipation. They've just introduced medalists from previous marathons. Everybody's been watching the race up on the big TV screens that they have here in the stadium. They know what's going on, have a pretty good idea. They've been getting the split times. Uh, also, of course, there is the mood that there was before the opening ceremony. They're waiting for a ceremony. Uh, it's later in the day. The shadows have already begun to fall across the stadium. But all in all, it's a tremendous mood of anticipation. We feel the same here, and uh, it won't be long now, will it? No, and uh, remember that scene, of course, the other day when Joan Benoit came in. Everybody knew at that there, point look that at, Joan uh, had built up a people, tremendous More than 90,000 with all the people not paying, probably close to 100,000 awaiting the arrival of the winner of the marathon in Los Angeles. Fourth, fourth or eight mile? Fastest of the race. Well, was I on? <laughs> Karen, you know that. Was I, I was talking, I thought Jim had stopped and I started to talk. Okay, fine, because I started to talk and I could hear myself back, so. Okay. Something important. Yeah. Yeah. by Chevrolet with the performance, the style, the innovation, the quality, and the value that make up today's Chevrolet. 
Light Beer for Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less. Transamerica. For insurance, manufacturing, and transportation, the power of the pyramid is working for you. And Kmart. From quality merchandise to low prices, we've got it and we've got it good. You're observing the final event of the Olympics, and it's Carlos Lopez, number 723, who has the lead. Charlie Spedding of Great Britain and John Tracy are trailing him. Tracy from Ireland, where I guess it's about, oh, it has to be 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, 8 or 9 hours time difference, and Ireland may be on the verge of winning its first medal in these Olympic Games. But this has become a shocking situation because Di Costello has dropped back. Seiko, who was looking so good, has dropped back. Salazar is out of it. And the people who cover and follow this sport very closely made any number of excuses as you look at Joseph Enzal of Kenya why Lopez couldn't win this. They talked about the, his age. He's 37. They talked about the heat. Well, it's hot today, but not as hot as some people expected. Smart? Well, there's been relatively little of it. Today. They talked about pace, they talked about his lack of marathon experience, they talked about all those things, but there he is, number 723, some two miles from the finish right now, with an eight second lead, having turned the last mile in 441, as they pass the 24 mile mark. Well, I think we're seeing at least two very unique individuals, Lopez, I think the oldest man in the field, and he will probably be the oldest man ever to win the marathon in the Olympics, and his story is one uh, of wonder is running over the past two years has just been amazing to everyone especially uh runners who are 35 and 36 years old as bill rogers and myself and then john tracy this is just something you couldn't predict this is his first marathon he's an irish runner i went to school at villanova we had numerous irish runners they always had problems running in the heat he has battled both guys i know he battled couple of years ago and that is one amazing athlete and Bill maybe you can just uh, enlighten us how you think Charlie Spedding has managed to put all of this together today. Did Bill Rogers hear us? This is a surprise obviously with three men with what is it five marathons between them and it looks like they're going to take the gold silver and bronze. Any of the favorites have about eight to ten marathons and the form charts are being really knocked off the loop. The only thing I can say is I believe Carlos Lopez... Is now 200 yards behind. Lopez has a lead of about 90 meters, I would estimate. He looks very strong still. Last report has Salazar some two and a half minutes behind. Carlos Lopez interviewed recently, uh, talking about running in the marathon, and he said, well, I just look at it as a tune-up for next year's cross-country world championship. Oh. He's not looking at it like that right now. That's right, he's 37 years old. I just, I kind of feel sorry for him because he won the world championships at 37 last year, and now next year they're going to be in his own home city, and the pressure there is going to be so great, and at 38 years old, to have that pressure and have to pull off probably the feet of the decade twice, and now he's going to have to do it for a third time in a row. Lopez, the leader, he's the man who won the silver in Montreal at 10,000 meters in 76. Eight years later, he's on his way to the gold. We believe we're about six minutes away from the athletes entering the stadium. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. What do we say? You know, he was in the marathon in 76, DNF. The DNF to DNF Rotterdam. Right, yeah. He was only first at two, but I guess he forgot. He, 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 right, he didn't know that. Um, yeah. Okay. No. Just wondering where some up there together. <laughs> Who's in Enzo still fourth as far as we know? Okay. 
Sal? Yeah. Uh, they have... Uh... Tell Lampley he needs an interpreter. He's doing the interview. He does? Ha Jim Donaway, you think Lopez speaks Sir, any English? Did not finish. Enough to do an interview? Marathon? Yeah? Was okay, he might be able to do it in English. Not a lot. Oh. Uh, would I create a hidden article? Then you're going to come back. You can check him out. He had an interpreter as a world-class country. Yeah. Yeah. I think he understood. Yeah, he should have an interpreter. Some other point before that. Here we go. New York, 83 Rotterdam. 84 Rotterdam. April 14th. He was a DNF. Look at him. The end of 18, 18 miles. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 18. Yeah. What? Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Tell Bill, by the way, even though most people think he's only run two, he's run three marathons, and I'll cover them because we've been saying he's he's only run two. No, Bill said that. We've been okay. saying he's right. run three. Right. Right. Okay. We, yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's why I, I want. That's why I want Bill to know that. It's, because, you know, it's an important point. <laughs> Carlos Lopez of Portugal is on an Olympic record pace. He's 37 years old. He'll become the world's greatest middle-aged hero if he's able to cross the finish line the way it looks right now for the gold with Spedding and Tracy side by side and what shapes up to be a great battle for the silver at the moment. Lopez is a man who in April of this year in Rotterdam ran in a marathon and there is a, all the way back in the pack Salazar the United States is, is two and a half minutes behind the leader. Carlos Lopez earlier this year, Rotterdam Marathon, April dropped out, exhausted by the heat, by the pace after 18 miles, but looking very, very fresh. Off Exposition Boulevard, down Menlo Avenue as he approaches the Coliseum. And again, if you saw the women's marathon, he will go from Menlo Avenue, make a left-hand turn into that Coliseum tunnel, and then emerge in front of a huge crowd. He will pass the finish line one time on the outside and cut to the inside, run another 400 meters, and take home the gold. He was looking over his shoulder, and he knows he's in great shape right now. Spending 396, Tracy 471, turning on to Menlo Avenue. Well, they're all looking back now because they know the positions aren't going to change too much. But I think in John Tracy's mind and Charlie Spetty's mind, they're deciding now how are they going to win the silver medal. Because for Tracy, if he takes it and picks up the pace and tries to break Spetty, he wants to be sure that there's no one in fourth place close behind so that if his effort fails and leaves him shattered and exhausted, that he won't get picked off in that last half mile. So you saw John Tracy checking behind him to know how hard he can push or whether he should be more conservative and just run for a medal. It's got to be a great feeling for Spedding and Tracy as they turn around and see that there's no one within striking distance. And Lopes has looked back. He's got 26 second lead, so he is in good shape and running a very great race, a courageous race. Uh, one in which he could have gambled, especially with Tracy and Charlie Spedding, he could have gambled and waited until they got into the stadium and just tried to pass them there. Carlos Lopez, ready to enter the tunnel. He's 5'6", 126 pounds. He is a loan officer in a bank in Lisbon. He may own the bank tomorrow. Into the darkness. And then back into the twilight he'll go. The crowd in the Coliseum will sense it. The tunnel is lighting his way. And in just moments, he will emerge. And 90,000 plus will salute him. That's the scene in the Coliseum. And there's Tracy, as I alluded to earlier. He's decided to make the move and go for the silver medal. He may not make it. He may break, you know, break down. But he knows he can get the silver order bronze. And he's decided to take the chance and go after the silver medal, which will be Ireland's first medal in these games. A salute to Lopez. 
And here's a minor uh, upset back in the pack that Seiko will not be the first, the first Japanese to finish. And Fitzinger of the United States has passed Alberto Salazar. Here they come. The battle for the silver. Tracy and Spedding into the Coliseum on the outside. But down the back straight away with about a 300-meter lead. Carlos Lopez of Portugal. but they didn't expect to be that far back. Ikazella dropping back about 20 or 25 miles, 20 miles into the race. Enzao now finishing, but the winner is Lopez of Portugal. Does it give the winner? This is the winning, uh, this is the winner, the Canadian girl. Okay. Do you get the winner in it? Suicide. Superaya. Okay. 209.24. Think of a car. 209.26. 26. Okay. No. Really? Can't understand me. Live at the Coliseum, having just entered, man in gray number 932 is Pete Pitzinger, who finished first in the Olympic trials 11 weeks ago, and he'll be the first American to come across the line having passed. Pitzinger, who was the winner of our trials, with a great rush over Salazar. There the is Salazar. 
and the marathon once again humbles all of the favorites, really. Well, I mentioned before, it was shocking uh, the last couple of days on that Coliseum track as you watch Fitzinger head around a turn to complete the marathon. The first several days of the track and field competition going pretty much according to form. And then the upset started to take shape. You had uh, McKay losing and Davers winning instead of 400. You had the great Decker and Bud confrontation that was won by Puika amidst the controversy. You had Stones and Zhu in the high jump last night. And only a bronze between them. And then in this one, who in the world could have figured it would be Lopez, Tracy, and Studding? Big hand for Fitzinger, Pete Fitzinger, crossing the finish line from West Newton, Massachusetts. Graduate of Cornell. I think as you mentioned, Al, as the Olympics go on, we start to see more upsets. And I think that's a reflection of the atmosphere the athletes have to live under with the Olympic Games. That village is, is like to be painted as an idealistic place where people of all nations come together, but they do all come together and get nervous together. Beautiful aerial view of the Coliseum set up for an impressive closing ceremony. They moved the start time of the marathon up uh, several minutes to enable all of the finishers to have their moment of glory, so to speak, at least be able to finish the long, arduous task in front of a capacity crowd. Fitzinger winds up in ninth position. We saw Salazar cross the line 11th, and Cuddle, the other American, is still out on the street. Well, it's a tough race for the Americans, and I think, uh, as Bill mentioned, we're going to have to really reevaluate the system for picking our marathoners. Now, I, I think we have to differentiate between picking the men's and women's Olympic track team and picking the marathon team. It's come to the, to the point where we have to realize that the marathon is almost like a different sport, and the athletes cannot be expected to run a marathon and then come back 12 weeks later and compete against the best that the world has to offer. Salah Ahmed, uh, Chibuti, one of those coming across the line. Remember, he was among the leaders very early on. Number 204. But the winner is Carlos Lopez, and let's go to Jim Lampley in the Coliseum. Jim? Al, uh, at the risk of seeming somewhat silly, I think we're going to have to try an experiment here. Uh, Carlos Lopez does not speak very much English. Uh, I do not speak Portuguese. We are hoping to get hold of the Portuguese interpreter, and I believe we have her right now. Uh, Ms. Santos, if you can help us interview Carlos. My first question is, this race began somewhat slowly. It ended rapidly. I wonder if he felt as though the pace of the race early helped him because he is a track runner with speed. Essa corrida começou devagar, mas depois foi aumentando o passo. Isso me ajudou em alguma maneira? Ajudou muito na medida em que eu vinha preparado precisamente para esta prova. It helped him a lot. He has come uh, prepared for this this race. Did the heat bother him at all? It was. Carlos is receiving congratulations of his wife again. Did the heat bother him at all, or did he try special training to prepare him for heat here? Oh, a temperatura lhe incomodou de alguma maneira? Você se preparou adequadamente? Sim, eu preparei me para este tipo de clima em Portugal e fazíamos muitos quilômetros de no máximo a quase do calor. Portanto, eu vinha preparado para tudo. Okay, he has come prepared for every, you know, for any type of climate. He has prepared himself. Uh, accordingly, with this type of climate. Did he expect to win? Você esperava ganhar? Pois eu vinha preparado para ganhar e para perder, mas se ganhasse um pouco melhor. Okay, he has he came prepared to win and to lose, and he is happy. One final question. Uh, he is uh, well into his 30s, almost 40 years old, and this is the crowning achievement of what has already been a great career on the track. Will he continue running competitively in big events, or will he begin to concentrate on other things? Okay, você tem quase 40 anos. Você pretende continuar correndo? Pelo menos mais um ano. Um, one more year, yes. Solamente um ano. Solamente. Por enquanto, por enquanto. Vamos ver. 
Carlos, if you understand us, you have our most heartfelt congratulations. Tremendous performance. Al? Thank you, Jim. Lopez, the winner, Tracy and Spedding, winding up second and third. There were the final standings. Again, a new Olympic record. Might have been a world record on a cooler day. We'll be back. For who, Sal? Okay. Oh. Oh, am I hungry? <laughs> I hear you. Pardon me. Uh, we're we're gonna. Willie's gonna go try to get Salazar right now. I don't happen to see him. Okay. How did the uh, Lopez thing look, Billy? Or not bad? Good. I almost had to do it myself in Spanish. You would have loved it. I'm not sure the Spanish-speaking population would have loved it. <laughs> I do not see them with my eyes right now, but there are a lot of runners gathered over there in the middle of the track. A lot of them receiving medical attention. Alberto! Alberto! Okay. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Okay. That's the line monitor. <laughs> Five. Okay. I got you. We're going to sum I it up. I got you. Yeah. Salazar's coming, Chuck. Okay. And so is Fitzinger. I got Fitzinger and Salazar both. Are we going to Jim? Yeah. Yeah, that's a boy. That must have, watch this. Watch this fan here. Yeah. You know, there's a fan. There's some guy goes over to the dugout. Fan to baseball. Now watch this. And this is this is amazing day. Somebody yeah. puts beer on the back. We're coming out of commercial in a minute. I think they said before. Standing is fine, Chuck. Is that what we're showing? Ah, yeah. That's our line monitor? What a yeah. terrific yeah. juxtaposition with the marathon. Yeah. Yes, Chuck. Back on the floor of the Coliseum, now I am standing with two Americans who have finished, Alberto Salazar and Pete Pitzinger. Thank you very much, folks, for coming to speak to us. Alberto, you tried to keep contact with the lead pack. At about the halfway point, you were 40, 43 seconds behind. And it was my understanding from Marty LaCroix that you had said you would be willing to be as much as a minute behind at that point. What was your race plan, and what stood in the way of its success? Well, I thought the 210 would win the race, and not too much faster than that ended up winning the race. So I felt that to go any faster than that pace would be suicidal. And so I just was going to try and go out there and try and run five-minute miles as long as I could. And if I was able to, hopefully I'd be able to pick it up a little bit in the end. But unfortunately, I slowed down even from that five-minute pace. You adopted various special training techniques to try to combat the heat. In retrospect, do you think they worked? Well, I guess not. You know, I... I've never really run a good race in the heat, a good marathon, so even with the heat training, maybe it's just not meant for me to run well in the heat, but I don't know, there'll be more races. I'll just have to try and train a little better next time. You can't win all the time. Are you satisfied with the race that you ran? Well, I'm satisfied that I did the best I could today. You know, I'm just, I'm disappointed in that I couldn't, I couldn't do as good as the U.S. fans wanted us to do, and they were really supportive on the whole course there, even though I was way back. We just went crazy every time we went by, and, you know, I just want to say thanks to everyone in the U.S. that gave us the support, and hope next time we'll be able to represent them a little better. Thanks to you for coming to speak to us. Pete Pitzinger, unless I miss my guess, I never saw you really in contact with the lead group. Was that uh, an error on your part? You wound up 11th, or did you plan to be closer to them? I, I wanted to be closer to the lead group, but I just didn't feel very good until I got onto the freeway. Uh, I was supposed to go the other way around. Uh, 
people said that on the freeway would be where we started feeling bad, but my stomach just wasn't right. I don't know if I swallowed some water wrong or what early on. John Tuttle and I uh, ran together to about 10 miles. Then it was really on the freeway where I started to click. Okay. Was it the heat? Uh, you know, I, I, I ran well through the finish. It was just, I wasn't having a very good day until halfway. That happens. Alberta spoke about the crowds along the way. Bill Rogers said that he believed it was the largest crowd along the course he'd ever seen for a marathon. What was the experience like running this race? It, it was unbelievable. I've never run a, a really big marathon with big crowds. I've never run Boston or, or New York or Chicago before, so I've, I've never experienced anything like it. People were just screaming the entire way, and as I'd be catching somebody, they'd look back to see what all the commotion was about. I felt like being like I was the first woman in a major marathon. You know, I wasn't in the lead, but everybody's screaming for me. This was a, uh, a big step for you this year, winning the American Trials and coming here with more notoriety than you might have expected to. Did it change your psycho psychological outlook on the race and the way other runners treated you to have gained that respect coming here? Well, I think people are still trying to figure out who Pete Fitzinger is, and I, I think today was a step in the right direction to establish myself. I feel I still have a good way to improve. Uh, I haven't. I, I felt that today I just had to run a, a, a very good effort, make sure I didn't you know, blow up in the heat, and that would help to establish credibility on my part. You'll shoot for Seoul in 1988? <laughs> Definitely. All right, Pete. Congratulations on a good finish, and thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you, Jim. Back to you, Alan. All right, thank you, Jim. Overhead view of the Coliseum. It's full. The very impressive closing ceremonies to come up. Another look there at the final standings. And Fitzinger wound up 11th. Salazar finished 15th. Interesting to note, Lopez, 37 years old, when he was 29, he won the silver medal at 10,000 meters in Montreal. He also ran in the marathon, Marty, that year. He did not finish. He did not finish, as we mentioned, a marathon earlier this year. I'm wondering if every 37-year-old in the world is going to go into training tomorrow. And what is the optimum age in your opinion now for a marathoner well i think the age uh, is not as much a factor as your motivation uh there are just so many sacrifices a marathoner has to make 110 105 miles a week is one thing but there's also the time away from your family the tiredness off the track a, a marathoner distance runner lives with being tired all the time and those are the, li the limiting factors and i think in the case of the Portuguese, they have been supported very well. They've trained together in training camps, and, and they've been somewhat full-time athletes, as have the American athletes. You know, there's, there's no making excuses about that. We've had some very good sponsorship over the year, and this sport is changing very quickly. Uh, the world records are, are, and the quality all through the fields is getting better because athletes are training so many more hours a day and with fewer distractions than the athletes were even three, four, five years ago. So I think that was a big factor that we saw today. Ongoing learning process, too, with technology and, and medicine and all of that right now. And, and looking at DiCostella and Seiko, they look so good for so long. Where do you think they went wrong? Uh, how do you think they would train differently? What would they do differently if they could run it again now? Well, I, I think they would just have to change their whole life. I think the marathon is such a tough event, and it's so hard to get to the top, as Alberto Salazar did, as DiCostella did, that once you get to the top, there's really not too many places to go but down. And I don't th think you can hold that peak for too long. Two or three years is a long time to be on top. And it kind of makes you stand more in awe with the accomplishments of Bibi Bikila, who came back uh, four years later and won again, or Frank Shorter, who won and came back four years later. I just think it's so hard to get to the top. There's so much training and pounding you have to put into your legs that you can't run a lot of marathons. And, by and large, what happened was the people we've been hearing about for the last two years, the people who were invent, uh, invited to all of the meets around the world and ran in them, lost to men who, as Bill mentioned, had a combined total of five marathons between them. So the competition in the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles has just concluded, and in a shocking upset, it was Carlos Lopez, the 37-year-old bank loan officer from Portugal who is the gold medalist in the marathon. We'll be coming back with Jim McKay reporting from the Coliseum.